Good afternoon, everyone. I am Brianna Ross at the Office and Events Coordinator for the Small Business Center. And today we have Teresa Gannon. Is it Gannon still? At Gannon for work purposes. <laughs> okay, okay, sorry, she just yeah. got married. Um, <laughs> she's the head of marketing at Simple Desk. And um, if you don't know Simple Desk, um, Small Business Center and Simple Desk have actually joined together and offered uh, for two hour free, one two hour free marketing session uh, with them. So if you do like Teresa and there's some information that you want to kind of learn a little bit more about, um, it's, a two, it's a two hour free session with her um, or I believe Jenny, which is the owner of Simple Desk. I just want to let you know, and I'll also give you a reminder at the very end. So if you are interested, just send me an email and I can help set you up with that. All right. And I'll pass this over to Teresa chatting about uh, marketing in the digital age. Hey, everybody. So I'm going to do a screen share today. I've got a presentation in Canva. Uh, if you don't use Canva for your business, I highly recommend you do because it's a super easy platform to use, especially if we're talking about digital marketing. It has templates, it has pretty much everything. I'm a huge fan. So I'm going to share my screen here. Um, I will talk a little bit uh, very briefly about my experience in um, marketing. So um, my background, I primarily started in nonprofit work and I've kind of worked in the housing industry. I've worked in publishing and my role now, um, I'm the head of marketing. So I do wear a lot of hats and work with a lot of different businesses. So um, I wouldn't necessarily say that I have a niche. Um, part of my job or my role is basically to facilitate the needs um, in terms of digital marketing for anybody. Basically, if you're service or product based, it doesn't really matter. It's kind of my job to kind of hone in on what it is that you do and be able to accurately story tell or do email marketing or whatever it is. So um, let's get started on the presentation. I'm gonna try to close myself up so I'm not um, blocking some of the, the text. And if I talk too fast, please let me know. I'm an overshare, so you're not gonna hurt my feelings at all. <laughs> so in this session, we'll be covering the following. So. Uh, the, the key point about this presentation is that there's so many different facets of digital marketing that it can be really overwhelming. Like you may have somebody who says, oh, you should be doing this or somebody that says, no, you should be doing this. Um, there's so many different like umbrella terms or things to know. So I'm going to be talking about the ones that are most thrown out around and then kind of highlighting the ones that are probably going to be the most effective for you. So we're going to be talking about social media marketing, which is obvious. We're going to start from the super, super easy stuff and get down to the more complex stuff. Uh, we're going to be talking about email marketing, uh, boosted posts and paid ads on social media, content marketing, which is a, an umbrella term. There's a lot of different things that fall under content marketing, which I will mention. Um, SEO, which is search engine optimization, SEM, and then of course, addressing any questions that you may have in regards to anything that I'm talking about or something that maybe I didn't bring up that you want to learn a little bit more about. So before we get started, this is something that I try to say in all of my presentations that is really important to note. So everyone's digital marketing strategy will be different. Uh, some will find email marketing incredibly useful, while others may find more success on social media. Um, working in outsourcing and having competition where people are kind of vying for outsourcing work, you really want to be cognizant of anybody who says that they can they like they they'll promise to deliver results you can't there's no magic formula or something that applies to everybody everybody's strategy is different so it really takes a skilled individual to understand what your needs are and and what kind of facets to explore um it there's no magic um like like recipe for your business um so this presentation is based off of best practices and what is the minimum that you should be doing in terms of marketing for your business so again there's so many different facets that are available and the ones that i'm going to be covering today are the more widely used ones that you realistically should be familiar with so each recommendation i'm going to be giving today is based off six years of experience in the industry during this time there's been an insane amount of changes so i've had to really keep up to date with those um, and then I've also worked with, with hundreds of businesses across North America. Um, I'm also rating these based off of what you absolutely need to have. So uh, I'm not saying here's an idea and you might want to do it. I will um, give a definition and give the purpose and then say, uh, I've got basically, I've got, I basically have it color coded. So green for you should do, yellow for maybe as you kind of grow, and then red for it's not really important at all unless you really want to explore it. 
So let's talk a little bit about social media marketing. So this is obviously the one that everybody knows. Um, it is the use of social media platforms like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to promote a product or service. So this offers you a way to promote your products and services, engage with your customers, build your, build your brand and grow your following. So it's a multi-purpose multi strategy. So I get asked often, how does it work? Because people get so focused on the direct selling part of marketing or just posting and they don't understand that it actually requires strategy. So you use a broad range of tactics and strategies to promote content to get people engaged. So an effective social media strategy um, employs the following. Um, of course, strategy, like figuring out what you're going to say when, um, content development and planning your schedule. So figuring out what your message is, what's the most effective way to convey that message, and when is the most opportune time to post your video or your carousel post or your static image. Um, it's also about engaging with your customers. So sometimes people get, will get into the trap of they know that they need to be doing an engagement post and they'll ask for engagement, but then not follow up with any of the comments. So if you're posting for the sake of trying to engage, but you don't do the effort to engage back, it's, it's a poor way to operate your social media. And then of course, reviewing your analytics to improve your strategy. So you should, you should always be looking at um, how your posts have performed just to see uh, what's most effective. So you don't have to waste your time creating content that's the same that that doesn't really do anything for you. The main thing to really remember about social media is that your focus is to, to provide value. So this is by far one of the most important things that you will need to ask yourself. So you should always be asking yourself when you're creating something, how can I provide value or information in a way that is well received, but also meets my target audience's pain points. So it's absolutely key that you understand your target audience and have buyer personas created to ensure your messaging hits these pain, hits these pain points. So buyer personas are just simple, like one pagers that say like, here's Teresa, she is 29 years old. She's a female living in the Quinney West region, and these are her interests. When you identify what that target audience looks like, you're able to kind of hone in on what they need. So somebody like me, since I'm in social media marketing, I might want to learn a little bit more about um, tools that can help me. And if you're a business that has a tool that can do that, I'm your ideal target audience. So you would have to, if you were that business, you would have to figure out what's the most effective way to convey we have this product or we have the service that can help you in a way that is also well received, but resonates with me as the ideal target audience. So what are the pros to social media? So like if you decide to go do social media, what are the good things about it? So it's a, a fun, easy way to build your brand. Um, social media is also the most widely used platform by consumers. So there's not very many people out there that don't have a Facebook or don't have an Instagram. They either have both or one or the other. Um, it's really become an integral part of a lot of our lives, as kind of sad as that sounds. Um, a lot of us can probably identify with just scrolling, as, especially depending on your age group, just scrolling randomly on your newsfeed and just trying to find that thing that catches our eye or that video that we want to watch. Um, so somebody's always going to be seeing your content. While it might not necessarily be the most ideal person sometimes some somebody's gonna be seeing your content no matter what um the great thing about social media is that it allows you some kind of creative expression so you can do videos reels stories carousel posts single image posts the possibilities really are endless depending on the platform that you're going for and it's not really expensive to do unless you're paying somebody full time like somebody like me who's got a bit of ex experience might be a little bit more expensive but maybe somebody who's fresh out of college and you've got them working full time it might be a little bit more affordable so um, you can also handle all this stuff in house it's really dependent on your skills and how much you're willing to learn and kind of try new things. So what are some cons to social media marketing. It is time consuming. Like as somebody who does this full time as a job, granted, I do have a lot of clients that just strictly do social media. It is time consuming. Um, it requires strategic implementation, which not everybody can do. Not everybody's brain works in a marketing way and can, and can kind of map out the buyer journey and what steps need to come next or how that information is best presented. It's not everybody's um, forte and that's okay. Um, so it does require a lot of time, effort, and planning, including engaging with your audience. Like I said, there's nothing worse than posting something and asking for feedback or comments and then just not responding to them. Like you need to put as much effort into the engaging with your customers when they take that leap to engage with you as you do crafting posts and scheduling them and figuring out what works best for your business. Um, it's just, it's so much, so another thing to remember, it constantly, you're constantly having to navigate new rules, algorithms, staying on top of trends and changes, et cetera, working in marketing for as long as I have, I can't tell you 
the amount of times that I've been like, oh, I love this facet of Instagram. And then they take it away or they change it. Or, you know, there's all these new rules to the post. So I'm kind of constantly having to stay on top of those things for my clients who don't have the time to read a blog post or catch up on the latest news about what's changing. So that makes my job difficult as somebody who specializes in it. So I can only imagine how difficult it would be for somebody just handling it in-house. Um, and it just, it's so much more than posting than uh, people just think it's just posting videos or posting pictures. It's, it's so much more than that. It's very strategic, but if we're talking about what you should be doing, my verdict for this is that you have to have it. You don't have to have both platforms. Um, obviously you're going to want to pick the ones that your target audience resonates the most with, like if you've got an older demographic, like 60 to 70, it's probably that they're not going to be on Instagram as much as somebody who's 25 to 30. So that might not be something that you want to explore, but you, it's up to you to determine what those channels are that are really going to work for your business and for your target audience. And if we're talking about being successful, so like, what are some things, like if you ask me, what are some things, Teresa, that I can do to help me be successful? Um, you're going to want to focus on building relationships. Um, it's not when you post it's to build a relationship it's to make that connection it's to kind of make that person feel like they're the only one in the room that you're talking to and make them connect because when they connect with you they connect with your story they connect with your messaging and they want to support you even if they can't buy into a product or service they want to support you in some way which word of mouth is one of the most popular and free ways of marketing um you can create a mix of engagement education educational and sales posts um, try out different types of content to see which ones work. Like just because you can do a video doesn't mean that that's beneficial for your target audience. Um, use a cross-channel posting strategy to ensure efficacy of your messaging. So um, what I mean by that is post the same thing on Facebook that you do Instagram. Just make sure it's sized appropriately because somebody who follows you on Facebook might not see your post because of the algorithm, but they want to see the post. So Instagram just ensures that they see it somewhere. So they might not see it on both platforms, but they'll at least see it on one. Um, and a big thing, focus on branding, brand voice, your target and providing value. If you're not providing value to your audience, you're doing them an injustice. You're doing yourself an injustice because they don't see the need to support you. Like you might have a killer product, but you could be shooting yourself in the foot because you're not creating that value, building those relationships to make them want to support you. It's not just a brand, it's you as a person that's part of that brand. Brina, did I see a, a comment come in? It was just me letting them know they can put questions in the chat. Okay, <laughs> Sorry. Perfect. No, that's okay. Um, so moving on to the next one is email marketing. So it is a form of direct marketing. So you're market, marketing directly to an inbox of a potential customer. Um, it allows, allows you to promote your business's products and services, incentivizes customer loyalty, tells allows you to tell your brand story allows you to engage with your customers um lead generation and much more it, it's multifaceted as well it has a lot of benefits if you know what you're doing um mailchimp active campaign mailer light and constant contact are all examples of email marketing platforms um which one you choose is really dependent on your skill level or what you're using it for like if you're just sending out random emails like a, a monthly newsletter mailchimp would be good but if you're looking to drip membership emails or um push people down the sales funnel something like active campaign that's more in depth is probably going to be your best bet um, so I get asked often how it works and there's a lot of rules to email marketing that you kind of have to follow, but I'm just going to go over the base so that you can understand how it does work. So to contextualize, to give you some like rationales to why you would want to invest in email marketing or why you would want to take the time to learn. There's a recent study out there that said that said for every dollar that you spend email marketing has an average return of $38. So if you are spending a dollar and you get $38 in return, obviously that's a great ROI. We like to see that. But obviously that um, ROI is predicated on the fact that you're doing email marketing correctly and you're providing people value. So email marketing allows you to engage with people we consider hot leads. That's my term. I just like it because I think it really just kind of indicates where people are in the sales funnel. So they've already gone to the trouble of signing up for your list and now it's time to provide them with values. So basically a hot lead is somebody who's shown some interest. They are easier to cultivate or to push to an action than somebody who's never seen you before. We call, I call those cold leads. So basically somebody that you're working on building that relationship with. Whereas with the hot leads, they're at a more receptive time for 
for email or for like a push or for a sign up or whatever it is that you're trying to achieve through email marketing. So most emails are call to action dr driven. So i.e. read this blog, buy this product, redeem your discount, book a call, et cetera, which is why when done properly, it can be one of the most effective marketing tools. And it's just one of those things like when the call to action is front and center, right in your face, people are more inclined to take it rather than like a kind of work around social media posts or something where it's not clear or there's too many steps to get to the end result. Um, and then there's a, a saying in marketing that the more touch points that you have with your ideal target market, the better. Um, um, so it just provides another touch point. It really helps hammer home your message and makes it more um, top of mind for people and also makes your strategy a little bit more effective. Um, so it can be as simple as sending out a single email to your list about a sale and as complex as streamlining your processes by email and leveraging a multi-email drip campaign. So it's really up to you what how you want to use it, but you need to make email work for your advantage. Like only use it in the way that's effective for you. Don't just do something because you have the opportunity to do so. So let's talk a little bit about pros because email marketing is a beast and it can be hard to tame. Um, it, I will say too uh, that I've done a lot of uh, webinars with a small business center that, and I have one specifically on email marketing. So if you want to learn some more, uh, feel free to ask Brianna for the link. It's all on the YouTube account of, of ones that I've done before. So you can watch that and kind of get a little bit more in depth with email marketing, but it basically helps you to build a relationship with your following and create a close knit community. So you should always be viewing that email as a close knit community and something that should be re rewarded like like it's a big deal for people to give you their email to receive your uh, communication so you want to treat it with like kid gloves you want to kind of nurture it you want to give it praise and you don't want to just spam the list. Um, so again, it keeps you top of mind with your consumers and it provides in depth target market info so any email marketing platform that you choose will have analytics. It'll give you a really good breakdown of gender, age, location. So you can really refine your targeting to ensure that your message is effective for that audience. Um, it's great because if you're one of those people who want to streamline your processes and make life a lot easier, there are email marketing platforms that can literally do, run your whole business by way of email. Um, it, it just makes things a lot easier if you're at that point. Uh, there are clear calls to actions, which means a higher return on your investment. And then you can also segment your contacts depending on which email marketing platform you use, using lists and tags for more targeted campaigns. So sometimes people get really hung up on the number, like, oh, my competition has 15,000 um, e on their email list. And I only have 200, but I am one of those people that I prefer uh, quality over quantity. So they, yes, they may have 15,000 followers, but when they email, they might only have an open rate of 2% and you might have 200 and maybe you have an open rate of 54%. So you have to kind of imagine it as like the quality of the leads rather than people just signing up and then not engaging with your list. So when you segment your list using tags or individual lists, um, it makes for a more refined uh, marketing effort. So for example, if you segment your list into people who are interested just in social media marketing and you have a class for social media marketing, you can pitch that directly to that specific list um, by way of email, which makes it more effective because you already know that they're interested in these kinds of topics. So they're more likely to sign up or complete a purchase or whatever it is that your call to action is. When it comes to cons, um, email marketing platforms can be really expensive depending on what you need them for. They're all price based off of your list. Um, so if your list size is huge, your bill is going to be a little bit more expensive. Um, there's a lot more competition than there was when I started like um, six years ago. Um, you're going to have to compete now with people that you didn't have to compete with because it's with COVID now that there's less in-person shopping and it's all more online, people are kind of pivoting towards email marketing. So just more um, more emails being sent. So you've kind of really got to make yourself stand out, which can be hard to do. Um, it can also be hard to grow your email list right away. So if you're just starting and you're trying to cultivate a list, it can be slow going, but, um, and people get really discouraged and kind of abandon their email, but it is something that takes a little bit of time. You have to provide the value or make them see the value in order to get signups. Um, and there's lots of email marketing rules to take into consideration so that you're not marked as, as spam. So um, if you do something wrong, like have a spam title or you don't, um, you're not really paying attention to your list size and you're just spamming as you like have integrated into a new platform, that can actually really harm your, um, like your, your sending reputation. Then 
all of your emails are either not going to be sent or go to spam right away, which obviously we don't want because then the messaging is lost. And it also requires strategic forethought. So you shouldn't be just sending out emails when you remember or like, oh crap, I forgot I have this contest and I want people to enter. So I've got to send them an email. It should be mapped out. Like if you've got some uh, something fun and engaging, you should give that time to do like teasers or give, give that email community like an incentive. Like, thank you for being part of our community. Here's 15% off for a product that is new. Like you need to be strategic about what you're sending and when and how that looks for your um, online community. So this one I marked as yellow because I find it a very important element, but not something that you need right away. So I always say start exploring this avenue once you've established your business and have mapped out what you're promoting and when. It's a valuable tool, but not worth the time and the effort if you don't have the time to commit to it. So if you're not at that point where you can do email marketing, maybe you don't have the staff or you're not ready to learn or you, maybe you just can't wrap your mind around it, there's no point in paying however much money per month for an email marketing platform if you're not using it like you need to be putting your effort and your money where it's most important for your business this is an important facet as you grow but it's not necessary as you start off so but if you wanted if you said like i'm already at that point like i'm ready to move into email so i'm just I'm gonna outline a few tips to be successful so again focus on the quality of your list not the quantity Get familiar with best practices. I, again, I have a webinar recorded on this topic that outlines all the best practices, the do's and don'ts so that you don't make a critical error. Um, establish a purpose as well as a cadence for your email marketing. So don't just send things, don't spam people. I had a client um, who's no longer a client, but she wanted to email like every single day. And then the list was just dead because people were just, they weren't getting value. They weren't connecting with the message and you would just send it to 400 people and nobody would open it because she was so hell bent on just sending emails every day. That's not how it works. You can do a monthly email. You can do a biweekly email. You can do a, a you should map out like, okay, I'm having a sale and I want to do two emails and this is when we're going to send them. Just don't spam people. It's, it's really poor practice. Um, Again, treat your email list as a community and provide them with value or something special for signing up. Make your call to actions as clear as possible and map out your customer journey. So if you're saying buy this product and you're sending them to one page and then they go to another page and then they go to another page, they're gonna drop off. Just send them where you want them to go in order to complete that, that task and make it as easy as possible for them. And then when you can, depending on your um, which which um, platform you decide to go with, segment your list for more targeted campaigns because you will see a higher ROI and you will be able to engage those people with the content or offerings that are most valuable to them. This is one I want to talk a little bit about because I've talked with a lot of small business owners, both in the marketing sessions and like people interested in signing on with us or pre-existing clients. And there seems to be like this urgency to do boosted and paid ads because of the algorithms on social media, like um, organic reach. So if you post something, it's kind of a little bit lower than it would because of all the constant fluctuation in algorithms. And people are like, well, I want my, my items to be seen. So I've, I have to do boosted and paid ads. So I'm going to get a little bit into why that's kind of like a toxic mindset, but I'm going to ask, I'm going to talk a little bit about what the difference is first. So uh, because this is what I get. I get all this all the time. Like, what's the difference? Like, if I do boosted, what's the difference between a paid? So a boosted post is an organic post that you've already posted on your page um, that you apply money to in order to boost it to an audience of your choosing. So normally, I always say, if you're going to boost a post, you're not going to want to do something that's performed poorly. You're going to want to look, look at the metrics and look for the posts that have a solid message, but also have a lot of engagement, a lot of comments, a, a, a large reach, because that's going to help um, send it farther out to the audience that you choose through your targeting. Uh, it's honestly the easiest way to do paid advertising on social media if you are interested in doing that. And boosted posts differ from Facebook ads because they're not created in ads manager, which is a separate hub. Um, and they don't have all the same customization features. Boosted posts have like really basic, like I want more likes uh, on my posts or I want more comments or I want more signups or I want more follows. Those are really like basic, um end goals for boosted posts and that's that's kind of limited to that the facebook ads are created through ads manager which is a whole other hub and they offer more advanced customization solutions so there are many advertising objectives to help you reach your specific business so it could be i want more downloads i want more email signups i want um i want more site traffic like there's so many different things that you can pick from that can kind of get a little bit overwhelming last time i counted there was like 11 plus options so you really need to know what you want to do or what you want to achieve from that ad to make it effective. Um, and there's also more um, ad 
placements available with this feature. So with Facebook, it, it, you can, with the Boosted Post, you can do it on Facebook and Instagram, but um, it's usually just in your newsfeed. Whereas with um, like the paid advertising through Ads Manager, there's like a whole different, like there's a whole slew of things that you can do. Like it can be in the side of somebody's on the desktop. It can be in the stories. Like there's a bunch of different placement options, which helps with visibility. Um, where a boosted post may initially optimize for page likes, comments and shares, or overall brand awareness, Facebook ads can optimize for app installs, website conversions, video view, shop orders, whatever it is that you're looking to do. And then I get asked often, like, Teresa, which one do you recommend doing? Like, you seem to have a firm grasp of it. Like, which one would you say is best for me? And I always say it depends 110% on what your objective is. So if you know what the purpose is of the ad and how much money you're going to put behind it, um, that's the key. So if you're just wanting page likes, go for a boosted post. You're probably going to save a lot more money. But if you're looking for something like really concrete, like I want more app installs or I want more visits to my website, um, you're going to have to pay a little bit more money for that. But that might be that might pay off more in the end for you. So really depending on it's really dependent on what you want to see happen with the ad. Oh, shoot. I don't know what happened. there. Sorry, guys. So I'll just show visually because most of us are on social media and we've seen these things. So I'll just show you the difference between what is a boosted post and a paid. So you'll see here, there's a little boost button on your page that you can boost. Um, and this is our organic post. This is something that was posted. This was uh, for our closed Facebook group for entrepreneurs where we answer questions and kind of just have a dialogue and answer any questions that they may have or give them resources. This post was boosted uh, by Jenny. So you can, and then you'll be able to see like how many people it was reached. This probably was a small ad spend just to get a little bit more in front of people, but this is a paid ad. So you can see there's a call to action button. They've got a carousel post. It says sponsored at the top so that you know the difference between the two. So you've probably seen both of these at some point on social media. It's just important to understand that they both have very different end results. So let's talk a little bit about the pros. So boosted posts are really easy. You don't have to be a marketing whiz. They literally set it up. You just press the boost button. It'll say, say what do you want to have happen? Who's your target audience? How much money? And you're kind of off to the races. Paid ads have a very direct call to action. So like read more, shop now, which can be a little bit more compelling for people. Um, and with paid ads, there are so many different options and formats. So if you're looking to do all these different things, paid ads can help you achieve them. It just allows you to explore and grow um, as your business does. There is the potential to reach a much wider audience. So reaching people outside of your current following. Um, it allows you to really refine your target. So you may under think that you understand your target market, but then maybe the analytics suggest something else. Like maybe you've reached people in a certain demographic and that's who you need to be kind of pivoting to um, reach out to. And I find that the analytics for both are really good. They're really up to the point, like they're not confusing. You can see who it is, where they're most seeing the the post. So like if it's, they're really being shown a lot on Facebook and there's a lot of engagement, maybe you don't put any ads fed toward Instagram, like make your money um, go towards what's most effective. And there's a lot of cons to ads too. And I'm not a fan of ads and I'm really hesitant of anybody who says like you need to be doing ads and here's why. So you can end up wasting a lot of money if you're not boosting the right posts or creating compelling ads it's like anything in marketing it has rules it has best practices if you don't know what you're doing you might lose out on a lot of money depending on how you set your ads up paid ads are really difficult to set up if you don't know what you're doing ad manager is complex if you go into it you're going to probably look at it and be like what the heck am i looking at i don't know where to go um there's certain like i said there's certain do's and don'ts um there's limitations uh, depending on what your objective is. So like there might be more options if you're just wanting page likes versus if you're trying to push people towards a sale on your site. It's really dependent on the objective that you choose, what the ability is for you in terms of creation of your ad. Um, the one big thing and the real reason why I don't recommend ads anymore is the recent iOS update for, through iPhone that just rolled out because it significantly impacted the ROI of any ads. So if you would have asked me a couple months ago if you should be doing ads, I would have said probably, but it depends on what your objective is or what you're trying to achieve or where you are in your business model. Um, right now, the, just to give you some context, the iOS update basically, most people are using apps for their phone to log on Facebook. They're not going on a web browser, they have a Facebook app or they have a Facebook Messenger app and they're using that. So with the update 
whenever you log into it for the first time, it'll ask if it's okay to share personal information. So like what gender you are, what your age group is, where you're located. Most people say no because it's a privacy thing, which means now there's significantly less data coming in. So Facebook is getting less data in terms of the users. Um, that also affects the ability for the ads to be delivered to people. Um, it, it just, we're seeing a really big decline in the, the effectiveness of the ads. And I've talked to another marketing professional actually about this this week. Um, she did some video ads for a client and we're kind of working together. And she said, you know what? We ran a, a Facebook video ad that performed amazing like a couple of months ago. And now we're seeing nothing. We did nothing different. We did the same targeting. We did the same post. Literally the only thing that was different was the link to the landing page was different not even seeing a fraction of the um, engagement that they did prior. So personally, I'm not a fan because of this update. It's really ruined, in my opinion, the ROI of any marketing efforts. I don't necessarily believe it's effective. So um, another big thing too, is you cannot edit your ad once it's been run. You have to literally stop it, duplicate it, and then hit that new one and make it run. You can't edit anything once it's been approved because it has to be approved by Facebook before it can run you can't make any edits. So you have to make sure that you've got the right messaging and everything's working. You'd be surprised how many times people set up ads and they don't function the way that they want them to. Um, and then again, this is another thing that I have a problem with. And that's just the, I feel like it's more of a personal thing than a more of a business thing. So if you're in housing, uh, financials and other, what they, what they call specialty industries, you have to mark your ads as such, like there's a, a section when you start your ad that says, are you in housing? You have to select yes, because you're going to, you have to, it's, it's a conflict of interest. They're worried about privacy. If that's what all these changes are really about. It's just Facebook privacy. Um, but essentially what happens is you get way less targeting, way less reach. It's just, in my opinion, not really fair. I feel like if you're going to force people to do paid advertising, everybody should have equal opportunity. Um, and that's more of a personal thing for me. Like I, I really can't, tell people to put their ad, put their money where something may not see a good return on investment, but also I think everybody should have equal opportunity for ads. So in my opinion, not worth your time, definitely not something that you need to do in order to, for your business to be successful. There's lots of other opportunities that are free or less expensive. I wouldn't worry about it personally. So let's talk about content marketing and this is the umbrella term. This is kind of the larger one. So content marketing is a strategic marketing approach focused on creating and distributing valuable, relevant, and consistent content to attract and retain a clearly defined ultimate uh, audience. So ultimately that is to drive profit and customer action. So a lot of the times when I'm meeting with people or like business owners and talking about their marketing efforts, like I said, they are so hyper-focused on the sale. Like marketing for some people, they think it's just direct pitch, like buy my product, sign up for this try this service, visit us here. Like that is okay, but it's not effective. You need to use content marketing to massage that messaging, to build those relationships, to build your brand, to make you sound credible because people are not just going to buy from whoever that they, they see. Like you have to put the work in to establish the why and identify the pain points. So again, instead of pitching your products or service, you're providing truly relevant and useful content to your prospects and customers help them solve their issues. And sometimes people say to me, like, Teresa, if I wrote this blog, but there's no call to action, it's just information based. It makes me look like an expert in my industry. I don't see a value for that. I'm like, that's sometimes you don't always necessarily see the value. Sometimes it's not tangible. It's not a monetary uh, return on your investment. It's a hidden, I've created something, um, I've built this foundation with somebody, I've built this relationship, I've cultivated it with relevant content so that they are more likely to buy your products or sign up for your services when that time and when that messaging comes. So content is literally king when it comes to marketing. It involves a lot of different facets. Um, you're providing something valuable to your consumer. So again, understanding what their pain points are and providing a solution, that would be your product or service. And it not only benefits them, but further forges that connection between your, you and your brand, which is it, it, like, it's so important. It's so important to have a connection with like who you're trying to pitch to. So if you're already using social media, like if you're already at that stage, you're doing some form of content marketing already. If you're not just doing direct sales pitches, if you're just posting about your products or services and there's no strategy and there's no content, and there's no value to it. You're not doing content marketing. You're just doing direct selling. 
Um, but if you're doing blogs, if you're doing like about me's, if you're introducing people to your team or talking about your message or like what your purpose is for your business, that's content marketing. Like it may be a form of a social media post, but it's still content marketing. Um, you provide valuable con so this is kind of like, uh, like a metaphor or something that I use for people to kind of make content marketing make sense. So you provide valuable content to soften the blow of the direct sales pitch. So I'll elaborate a little bit on that. So the, the metaphor that I kind of gave her, like the, the, the idea that I kind of gave was like, say you're falling and you don't provide content marketing. You're just direct sales pitching. If you're falling, you're hitting every tree branch down on the way. And it's not going to be a soft blow, but if you're getting those tree branches out of the way by, by providing content, by providing education, by making something fun, by asking people to engage, clearing that branch and softening the blow, cushioning that blow for when you're going to say, want that direct sale, I want you to buy my product, I want you to sign up for my services, whatever it is, you want to cushion that with the content to make it more receptive. Because I always say if people believe in you, if they feel a connection with you, they're going to support you. Even if they can't buy your product or service, they might recommend you to somebody else. And that's really invaluable in terms of marketing. So what is content marketing besides blogs, besides posts? It's infographics, it's landing pages, it's podcasts, it's blogs, it's eBooks, webinars, all content marketing. Like this is content marketing for me. I, I have content that I can say like to my following, hey, I'm having a, a, like a webinar with a small business center that I would love for you to join. And people see me as somebody who knows what's going on in the industry. They, they see my face, they, they know what my credentials are. That's content marketing for me because I'm building that relationship. I'm building that trust that I know what I'm talking about and making people feel comfortable learning from me because not everybody's comfortable learning. It's, it's a, a steep learning curve. If they feel like they know me and they, that they can learn something from me, then that's, con that's content for me, but it's also a good relationship builder for myself and our customers. So let's talk about pros because like I said, sometimes people like don't see the dollar sign. They're like, why would I put all this effort in if I'm not seeing immediate dollars? So it does lead to increased sales if you're able to build that relationship and get that engagement. It is, doesn't really cost you anything if you know what you're doing. Like if you've got a writer on your team, use that writer, like make them write some content. Like if you have a good iPhone and a good bright setup, you can make videos. It doesn't have to be something like super crisp or super clean. You can do all these things and still have them look nice and not spend a lot of money. Um, you'll get better customers who have more loyalty because they have a relationship with you. Um, and one piece of content can really often be used across multiple platforms. So if I'm writing a blog, I'll use that in the email, but I'll also use it for social media posts. And then I might repurpose it later on for a reel. So there's different ways that you can use that content you can use it at that time or you can repurpose it at a later date and it's already a key part of any marketing avenue you choose to explore if you know what you're doing if you know how to make those connections content marketing is going to be there just dependent on how it looks um, it does provide additional content for social media marketing and contributes to seo efforts by generating natural inbound links and building up good content on your website for search. So for example, we write a lot of blogs, we write a blog once a week, and it's about a certain thing that will help small business, small business owners. So it might be like four tips for social media ads or um, do's and don'ts for email marketing. I'll SEO that so that it's easier for small business owners to find in terms of search, which leads them to our website. So once they've read the blog, then they're already on our website, which means they might sign up for our email list. They might uh, check out our about us page, kind of get more familiar with us. Anytime that they're on the website, it's a good thing because then they're more likely to take a certain action. It helps with brand awareness. So people see us as somebody who's also, while we do outsource um, and obviously getting business is great, we make people feel comfortable by saying, hey, we also educate if you're not ready to take that step. Um, and that helps with brand awareness and makes builds that relationship with us. And, and I think that really has helped improve conversions. Like people see the value. So they're like, you know what? I, you made me feel comfortable. You clearly know like what's going on. Like let's take it to the next step. You made me feel comfortable with outsourcing. So that's helped us monumentally when it comes to content marketing and, and getting some conversions. So the cons there aren't really many uh, besides the fact that this type of marketing forces you to think kind of like outside the direct sales pit bubble. Um, if you're not a marketing guru, I can tell you how many people have been like, well, this doesn't talk about my product, it doesn't talk about my service. Get away from that kind of thought because it's not doing you any good to just pitch your product. Like you are just trying to like throw something to the wall and hope that it sticks. It, you need to massage the content marketing around the direct sales pitch. It, there's just no other way to, to do online like digital marketing than this kind of strategy. 
So my verdict is, on this is absolutely a must have. You don't have to do everything. Just do be really good at one thing. Like be really good at blogs. Do be really good at doing videos. Whatever it is that's content that's valuable for your customers, but also doesn't take up a lot of your time. Just be good at that. Um, and you want to provide them with value. That's the most important thing about any digital marketing effort is that it's supposed to be valuable. It's supposed to make somebody want to do whatever it is that you want them to do. If you're providing no value, there's no reason for them to take that action that you're wanting them to do. So if you're going to be doing content marketing, again, focus on building your, your relationships with a focus on value. Map out your content at least a month in advance. I map all of my content out for all of my clients at least a month in advance, whether it be social, whether it be email, so that we both have a visual representation of what's going on in the month. Um, SEO your blogs to increase your organic traffic, and I'm going to go into SEO in the next slide. Um, use your content in more ways than one. So repurpose it, break it down. Don't like beat yourself over the head trying to come up with the newest thing that you can. It's okay to reuse things or to break things into smaller chunk chunks to make it go farther. Um, and then remember that while content marketing is about engaging and providing value, it should also have a purpose. It's, it, it really should be purposeful. Um, so what are types of um, things that you can do? You can create a lead magnet and embed it on your website. So that's like a downloadable, which asks for somebody's email. That's a great way to kind of build your website or build your email list. You can create YouTube or IG, IGTV tutorials, kind of representing yourself as an expert in your field. Um, you can use your blog in an email. There's all different ways that you can create content and make it kind of go a little bit farther for your efforts. So let's talk about search engine optimization. And we're kind of moving more into complex things. Um, this doesn't make sense to a lot of people. And there's a reason why, because you need to kind of wrap your mind around what the purpose of it is and the fact that it is a little bit more difficult. So SEO in layman's term basically is the process of understanding how your target market market searches for your products or services and leverages those keywords through, uh, sorry, not a social media strategy. I don't know why I put that through like a, a keyword strategy. So an effective strategy allows for you to place higher in search engine results than the competition, which increases your overall organic website traffic. Um, obviously organic is better because you're not technically paying for it. It's just organic traffic that people get to. Whereas if you're doing like paid ads on Google, you're gonna be spending a, a ton more money than you would if you had like a good SEO strategy. Um, so like to kind of give you a little bit more of an idea of it. So like, if you know that you're like, and you're in the plumbing industry and you know that people are searching for plumbers Kingston, then you're going to want to look at the, how, how often they're using that keyword or what keywords they're using that fit with your, um, like your service industry and that are properly searched. And you'll probably go onto your competitors pages and see some of them employing an SEO strategy. And you're gonna to wanna to leverage that. You're gonna to wanna to understand what keywords are people using to search so that you pop up first on the search. Um, obviously the higher on the list that you are, the better your chances are to capture a new customer. How many of you have like Googled something and have scrolled beyond the second page? I highly doubt that you have. It's usually the first three people are the ones that you pick. And then after that, it's maybe you're gonna, if you don't see what fits your needs, you're going to Google something else. You're going to use some other keywords. Nobody scrolls even halfway down the first page. The higher that you rank, the more likely you are to have more web traffic. So you want to optimize both your content. So anything that you put, like in terms of blogs or whatever on your website, you're going to want SEO strategy that, but you're also going to want to do your overall website. So any of your landing pages, um, your uh, images that you're putting on there, there it's a whole umbrella thing a whole umbrella strategy that you really have to understand what goes into it to like improve your score um and i think you should at least at minimum have an seo strategy just for the website like if you don't have time for the content that's okay but at least have an seo strategy for your website so it leverages the most relevant keywords for searches it also factors in elements like title tags uh, meta descriptions schema subheadings alt text URL slugs, how easy it is to read and crawl your site. And it gives your site like an overall ranking. And obviously the higher the ranking, the higher your position on a Google search page. Again, if you're even halfway down, people are not gonna see you. It's usually the first three. That's usually the position that you wanna be in. Obviously number one is best, but if you can try to get it up there um, and search engine optimization too, people make the changes and they're like, oh, I'm still like fifth. You have to give it time to register with Google that you've made these changes. You can submit it through Google to have the bots crawl it and give it a score faster, but it, 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 that's up to you. Like that's a whole other can of worms and it takes a lot of time, um, but you do have to allow it time to kind of um, 
Google to know that you've made those changes and to adjust your ranking accordingly. So what are some pros for this? So it allows you to better understand your target audience. It increases organic traffic, helps you to get a leg up over the competition because if you're first, your competition is going to be the second one, second choice, and we always want to be first. It doesn't really cost you anything if you understand it, unless you have to outsource it. And then it also depends on who you outsource it to. Some people just specialize in SEO and it can be pretty expensive. Some people offer it as a package, um, like, like an add-on. It really is dependent on who you're outsourcing it to. But if you do outsource it, make sure you outsource it to somebody who knows what they're doing. Sometimes people say, oh, I know SEO, but they have, they do the bare minimum or use something like Yoast as a on WordPress to basically say like, oh, I've SEO'd this. Like, it'll tell you that something's SEO, but it doesn't mean that's SEO'd properly. So, um, and then for um, me, I always say that it creates a better user experience. So if you know what people are searching and they're finding your website, then you're probably hitting the nail on the head. They, they have an experience on your website. It's exactly what they're looking for. As long as you've made your site crisp, clean, call to action, very obvious, um, it makes a better user experience because they're actively crawling a site that fits what it is that they're looking for. So what are some cons? Because this can be very confusing. There's a lot of different elements. I totally understand. I could go on for days about this. I was actually taught by somebody who owned his own SEO company in Kingston and was a professor. So it, there's a lot of things to take into consideration. I can get that it's definitely overwhelming. So it has to be done correctly. So something like keyword stuffing, like say you find a keyword and it's searched a thousand times, you're like, yes, this is exactly what I want to use. If you just plunk that keyword into every page with no strategy, just put it everywhere, it's what happens is that your site becomes blacklisted. So Google says, Google's not dumb, it's smart. It knows that you're just trying to get more eyes on your page. It will blacklist your website so that you don't even rank like hardly at all. And that's obviously not something that you wanna do. You wanna have somebody who understands how SEO works. So that way your page can always be on that first or your website can always be on that first page. SEO can be difficult for some people to wrap their minds around. The keywords are really important. And believe it or not, people struggle to grasp that. I had a whole course just specifically on SEO and had market marketers in the class. It was a marketing class. And some people just couldn't grasp what it was. It's just understanding at a basic level, just understanding how people search and leveraging that to position your website first. And that's all that it is. It's not like this really complex thing. Um, there's a lot of different facets, but if you understand it, it it's going to really help increase your traffic. Um, there are so many different things to know to implement that it can get overwhelming and it does require you to stay on top of to make sure that the keywords haven't changed or your competition hasn't done a better job. I've worked with people who had excellent SEO strategy and they're like, well, so-and-so did this and now I'm fourth. I'm like that's probably because the keywords are changed or somebody's SEO their website better than you have. So now you have to reevaluate. Um, not saying that you're going to have to always make changes, but it's just good to keep an eye on where you're ranking so that you can make any changes as quickly as possible. So my verdict is I do, I know it's complicated, but I do recommend the strategy to a lot of small businesses because Google's the main way that people find you. So if you're not ranking where you need to be, somebody else is and somebody's getting your business. So even if you have to outsource it, um, go for it, but just make sure that you're really investing in qualified individuals who know what they're doing. If you are like, I get it, I understand it. What are some tips to help me be successful? You got to get into the mindset of your target audience. Don't SEO this puppy, like, this is what I want to see. What, how are people searching that are, that are your ideal target audience? And what does that look like? So I always say there's something called the Google Keyword Planner. You can plunk as many keywords in there as you want. It'll tell you how often the keyword is searched. So you can pick the most relevant keywords for your business. Um, you got to understand how different pieces come together to contribute to your overall SEO score. So like having a meta description. So that's like when you see a link and there's a little description underneath on Google, that's a meta description. Um, sometimes you'll have title tags. So there'll be like the header tag, a header, and then like a smaller uh, tag that you have to SEO and kind of wrap your mind around that. And there's alt tags, which is like a tag that's relevant to your keyword for your, for your photos. So there's lots of different things to take into consideration, but if you work with somebody who's qualified, they're going to know that stuff and they're going to take care of it for you. And then again, keep an eye on your ranking each month to ensure keywords have not changed and that you are ahead of the competition. Because if you're not first, you're last. <laughs> uh, now we're going to continue on with the trend of a search engine uh, marketing, which is kind of similar to SEO. Um, and I get asked about this a lot because people are so consumed with their ranking on Google that they're like, okay, I want to do SEM. So which is that search engine marketing. 
SEM is a form of ad spend. So again, putting money towards a marketing effort with a specific goal in mind that increases your overall visibility in search engines. So you are not paying for ads to appear as a search result on, um, or sorry, you are paying for ads to appear as a search result on search engine results page. So if you've ever Googled something and you see like the top three say ad, that's SEM. That's a way to even get even more ahead of any of the other websites is a direct ad with a call to action to the most relevant landing page. That's SEM. It's not the same as pay-per-click ads. So you may have heard pay-per-clicks or cost per impressions. Those are visible on other sites. That's where you pay Google basically to put it wherever it's relevant. So that could be other websites, YouTube, um, sometimes social media. Um, that They're totally different. Search, SEM is just for Google search. Um, and ads are often the first thing that people see on search, which is why people love it because they obviously want, there's so much competition sometimes that they love to be positioned ahead of everybody else. So again, similar to SEO, it's based off of keywords. So when users search for those keywords, they see your ads and it works kind of like an auction. All ads online work as an auction. So there's things to take into consideration, like how you format it, what your call to action is, how likely it is to convert, what your keywords are, um, whether or not it's relevant to that community. And everybody's trying to find a strategy that works for them, but also beats out the competition. So it's an auction. If you've got all those things nailed down, you're going to place better than if you just kind of put something together willy nilly and hope for the best. The more strategy, the more thought you put into it, the better your ads are going to rank. Um, and this is called a quality score. They basically say, what's the quality of this ad? How likely is, is it to convert? Anybody who does better than you is going to rank better than you. It's just how it works. So what are some pros to this? So it allows you to better understand your target audience. So again, understanding those keywords, it can increase traffic to your website and it does help you get a leg up over the competition because you do rank higher than landing pages and you're really pushing them to a landing page that is supposed to convert. So what are some cons? So it must be done correctly and relies on understanding of the right keywords. So you could be paying a lot of money for not having the right keywords or the right phrasing or whatever it is. You don't wanna waste money. It's auction based again. So somebody could always be doing a better job no matter how much effort you put into it. Even if it's just, they might have one, one point over you and they're still gonna show up for you because they've just done something that you haven't. And of course, Google or Facebook, or they won't tell you what the other person did. They just say, this was your quality score and somebody just obviously ranked better than you. It does require trial and error and can be very expensive, especially if you don't know what you're doing. And people often skip over the ads in favor of the first three websites on the search. So somebody like me who's younger, um, this is a growing trend where we're just go right to the websites. We're like, ah, we see ads scrolling on by, gonna go to the first website. Sometimes the older generation, or if there's like a compelling call to action, will click on the ads, not necessarily always, but there's data to suggest that like some, like usually like 40 up are more likely to click on the ads. There's not a lot of young people who are clicking on ads because they know it's part of a strategy. Like we know how social media works. We know how stuff online works. We're just gonna go right to the website. So you, I just wanted to show a little picture. So this is um, SEM strategy here with the ad. And this is also a form of SEM. So it could be just here or you can actually showcase your products. The showcasing the products works because it's a visual representation and makes people excited, but they can be more costly. So my verdict for this, not a necessary part of running your business. I would not devote any time to it unless it's valuable to your target audience and you have the skills and funds to do so. People are like, I should be doing paid ads. Everyone's doing paid ads. I got to do this. I got to do that. If you don't know what you're doing, then you're just throwing money away. Like it's not, we're not seeing the same return on investment. There's a lot of things taken into consideration. Some people can do it really well and others can't. Why waste time as you're building your brand and expanding on something that you're not going to see an ROI on? Focus on the things that are important and go from there. Then you can, you're more than welcome to do these things. Just make sure that you're focusing on the important stuff. So let's wrap up. So must haves in your business model, social media presence doesn't have to be both, has to be at least one. An SEO strategy that just ensures that people can find you when they're looking for your products and services. The easier it is that they that it is to find you, the more likely you are to see a higher return on your investment. Content marketing, so that's an umbrella term. So that could be videos, blogs, um, carousel posts, um, IGTV reels, tips, tricks, whatever it is. That's all content marketing, and that's basically the core of your marketing strategy. Like it's probably the most important because it's what's going to help when you do those direct sales um that would be my absolute must have to do 
So I think email marketing should be explored once you have a handle, obviously, on the above strategies and when your website is fully functional to make sure that your return on investment or your call to actions are feasible and that they work and that there's not going to here, going there. It's all very streamlined. I love email marketing. I've been doing it for a long time and I'm a big fan of it, but I don't always suggest it to people when they're just starting out. Start with start small, get familiar, get comfortable, start wrapping your mind around how to properly strategize when it comes to your business and then go for email marketing. It's not that I'm saying don't ever do it. I'm saying do it when you're ready and when you feel comfortable and confident to do so. Um, what you don't need to see success is SEM strategy. Don't need that. Paid ads or boosted ads. No, I, not, none of these paid things are worth as much money as you're probably going to spend as somebody who's not trained in advertising. And I will promise you this, anybody who outsources that will cost you an arm and a leg because they're not only talking about ad design, they're also talking about how much money um, you're going to put towards the ad campaign. That's not factored into the fee. That's two totally separate things. So if they're saying you have to spend $200 um, in terms of like what the ad actually runs with, um, that's not included in whatever their baseline fee is to do that. So not, I personally feel like it's not worth your time. And then again, please know that you can explore these things, but they're not necessary to your overall success. The social media, the SEO strategy and content marketing are really what you're going to want to focus on just as you begin your business. So does anybody have any questions about anything that I talked about or maybe that I didn't talk about? I'm just going to stop the recording now.